so welcome back everyone uh, so so we have uh, bogdan young from pittsburgh uh, for the last uh, talk so he will talk about uh, dah house and the uh, concurrence groups uh, please bogdan all right thank you thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak and uh, it's always great to see uh, old friends um so this this is some work which kind of uh, appeared recently but it's it's maybe like five years old uh it's it's some joint work with uh Siddharth Sahi <clears throat> and um uh see uh didn't compile the outline anyway so I'll uh uh, I'll talk about the, the, the emergence of uh, some <clears throat> some congruence group, uh, some congruence groups, or the, so sub subgroups of SL2Z, congruence subgroups of SL2Z in this uh, as kind of outer automorphisms of this double affine Hecke algebras. And this phenomenon was known um, just for this class of, I think it was written down by Cherednik, it was for. Um, untwisted uh, extended dahas, fully extended dahas. And the, 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 the group there that he, the, he uh, revealed is the full SL2Z. But as you, as you go to the other twisted cases and various levels of extend, extendedness of a daha, you, you start getting more uh, more co co congruence groups. So I'll, I'll um, so we, we, we serve, um, I'm going to explain a little bit the potential applications of this, at least as we conceived it. Uh, we, we did not develop this, uh, although we, we, we look at large number of examples and so on. So it's a kind of a very rich structure and very interesting things. Uh, come up and some connection with arithmetic and so on. But um, it's not quite, I'm not quite ready to talk about that. So <clears throat> the, the subgroups that, the groups that will appear will, will, will be like this. So you take SL2R, you take the simply connected cover, and then you're gonna have subgroups you know, gamma subgroups of SL2Z, and you're gonna take the, their pre-image, your full pre-image inside the uh, simply connected cover. And if you get the, the pre-image of SL2Z, you get this, you get this group that abstractly can be described as the braid group of, of, of three strands. And then you have subgroups. So that's kind of a, this, these are the groups that appear in this story. And um, what it will happen, it will have some, some extension of groups or algebra, something like this. So it's kind of a small one inside a big one. Uh, now these groups, gamma tilde, the, uh, the covers will act on you as automorphisms, whatever that is, groups or algebras. Uh, and <clears throat> kind of a, the kernel of this, of this projection will, will act by, by inner automorphisms. So you, you get a map from gamma, so it's kind of a true, the true uh, subgroup of SL2Z will act as outer automorphisms on you. Now it might have a little kernel, maybe some, some uh, minus identity matrix or something like that. Um, the full thing uh, on 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 u zero on the smaller piece of this uh, extension, gamma will act, and even gamma tilde will act by inner uh, automorphisms. So, whenever you have such a group acting as outer automorphisms of an algebra, let's say it will start acting on the representation theory. You can Take a representation of of you, precompose with some uh, some action, 
of an element from this from, from this gamma and you get a new representation so kind of this starts organizing somehow representations of you into orbits and so on so uh, now the representations we we, we look at it's uh, let, you see the, the kind of uh, decomposition of this representation of u restricted to u0 will, will start to be preserved because this, this gamma doesn't act on u0. So it will act on the kind of types, on u0 types. So uh, we look at representations of u, which are u0 finite, which means any vector sits in a finite dimensional vector space, which is stable under U0. Uh, and we also look at representations where uh, isotypic components, when you restrict to U0, the isotypic components will, will be finite dimensional. So in this, these are constraints so that, um, you know, in, in infinite dimensional representation theory, it's a, it's a lot more complicated, you have to, deal with topology and so on. So it's just for, uh, for, for first, first level of approximation of this phenomena. <clears throat> uh, very good. So this is with the theorem that emerges, kind of a meta theorem that emerges in this context. You, you take a, a gamma stable representation of U, you fix a simple representation of U zero. And as I said, you start pre, Precomposing with gamma and with, with, with the restriction to U0, the entire structure of a representation is preserved. So it keeps acting on this isotypic component. So you get this finite dimensional representations of, of gamma, they're projective representations because of a sure lemma. And um, in, in, in a couple of examples we looked at, we, you, you, you can lift this to a to an actual representation of gamma. Um, maybe by going to a, a finite cover, but sometimes it just gamma itself can be extended to a representation of gamma itself. And the examples that we know, um, Charednik had this, the really quotients of, um, of uh, po polynomial representation of a DAHA. So we, it requires some specialization of the parameters and these representations have, um, so the, the polynomial representation of a DAHA is, is not invariant under the full SL2Z. It's invariant under just one of the generators. I think Cherenny calls it tau minus. In the, uh, world of type A combinatorics, this, this action of tau minus is the, this, this NABLA, the, the NABLA operators of Garcia and Heimer. It kind of commutes with the Y operators and uh, uh, preserves the eigenstructure. So, uh, and he, he, he looked at quotients which, which also um, have a, uh, a form compatible with uh, what he calls the Fourier transform. So these two are enough to, to generate the SL2Z. So he has these quotients on which the kind of SL2Z acts. And the, the, whenever this happens, it's, it's a lot more structure that somehow it's uh, possibly forced, although it's, it's not, it's not uh, it's not entirely clear how 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 this happened. I mean, the, the algebra structure comes from the, the fact that the polynomial representation has an algebra structure, but Cherenny calls this uh, non-commutative uh, Berlin algebra. And kind of the oldest phenomenon of this type it's, is the work of Katz and Peterson. Um, so in that case, the groups are are so the, the, the small one is a finite while group. And the big one, it's a semi-direct product of this with a kind of a rank and discrete Heisenberg. Represent we construct these representations on level at uh, k theta functions. And we look only at the trivial representation. So in this context, this is how it looks like. 
gamma HSL2Z. And again, on, on the spaces, again, you get this ring structure. In this case, is the representation ring of uh, in the category O for the level K uh, representations. And again, you know, the, because the entire multiplicity structure is preserved, you can also cook up some modular function in this fashion and so on. So this is uh, all, all the emergence of, kind of modular functions in the representation theory of um, affine uh, Lie algebras. Okay, but yeah, so that's that's about it. This is kind of um, w w once you build this up at the level of this level of dahas and so on, kind of this, this entire scheme becomes uh, like a big question <laughs> of what's happening and. Uh, the difficulty it's actually in actually implementing it it's our <clears throat> kind of poor understanding of finite dimensional representations of a, of a DAHA. so uh, it's, it's particular difficult case at root of unity and uh, i mean we've we, we've seen hard we, we looked at uh, rank one DAHAs and so on it's 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 very very beautiful but also very hard it's uh, very good Okay, so these are the, this is kind of a synopsis of what the possible applications could be. Um, so let me tell you what, a little bit more precisely, what, what the congruence uh, groups appear in this context. So, uh, right, you have this uh, principal congruence subgroup, which are uh, the kernel of uh, mod n morphism. And for n equals one, we just take the full group SO2Z. And the congress subgroups to be a congress subgroup must contain uh, a gamma must contain one of these principal ones. And the, the, the smallest n with this property is called the level. And there are these other other congruent subgroups, which are not the principal ones, uh, they, they come from, it's kind of a reduced mod. Uh, I think uh, in here it's R instead of capital N. So mod R they reduce to kind of upper, upper triangular, uni, uni triangular. And uh, from this Daha picture only R, one to three will appear. So from this point on, I will not even talk about other uh, other ends. Uh, and this R in the as it emerges from the DA has to do with the twisting of um, you, you know you get you get to be attached in some constructions from uh, attached to affine the algebras. And, you know they're twisted and untwisted the algebras. And kind of this twist number. And uh, this is how this R will appear. Uh, and there is another one, which is somehow kind of a non-standard presentation of gamma one, two. It looks like this, where the kind of uh, the, the trace and the other trace uh, reduced to zero mod two. Uh, there, mm, yeah, so gamma, Gamma one two and gamma one two prime are conjugate inside SL two Z. Um, so very good. So you, you take these two two generators of SL two Z, and uh, the first one and the R power of the second one, but remember R is just one or two or three. You generate this kind of secondary uh, principal subgroups. And as I said, gamma two, gamma one two and gamma one two prime are conjugated. So in you know, a set of generators here, it's, it's the square, the square of this matrix. And then this you have to, you have to conjugate. Very good. Now you look at the pre-images inside the universal cover of SL2R. And if you, 
uh, as I said, the, the full pre-image of SL2Z is this braid group on, on three strands. So um, it's generated by two elements, you know, satisfying the braid relation and so on. Kind of uh, the fiber is generated by this element C, which is one, two, one uh, squared, I guess, yeah. Or one two cubed, uh, and if you if you take powers of the second uh, generator of U two again for two two and three they, they uh, U one and U two power R satisfy this you know type B and type G braid relation automatically. So these are the pre-images. You, you see gamma one R is generated like this. So um, the pre-image inside the universal cover will be generated like this. And uh, you get this, this, uh, this braid groups of type B, B2 and of type G2 that appear as kind of covers on, of this kind of um, uh, secondary principal subgroups. And of course, you can, you know, the pre-image of gamma one prime is again conjugated in there. So this is the picture, and uh, yeah, so the, the the vertical maps and there's a yeah. As you see, I'm not sure how visible it is. There's a difference in the font with the U. What one is a kind of this is this Gothic font. The other one it's a. Um, this usual font. Yeah, so the, the, the U's correspond. The U1 goes to U12 and uh, U2 goes to U21. Very good. So this is kind of a picture as it will emerge. And uh, we'll have some, some subgroups that will also appear. They will be subgroups in this gamma one R. Again, this will depend on the kind of the flavor of the how that you want to look at, twisted, untwisted. Uh, very good. And they, they will also have some level. And the level that will appear will be at most the index of a root lattice inside the weight lattice. So it will be small for, for most cases, but for in type A, it could be as large as the rank, let's say. Uh, so, it, you know, they could be fairly deep inside the, inside SL2Z. Very good. Yeah, so this is some, some idea of what, what, what kind of groups appear. And now let me, let me talk about the, the algebras. Very good. So, you know, there are some constructions of the Dahas, which uh, I guess everybody has seen and so on, you know, in the style of uh, uh, Cheretnik and so on. Uh, we, we, we developed these other um, presentations. Uh, you know, ultimately you get to the same things. So you have to prove some fear. I'm saying that they're the same object. This have a, a, a little bit of a more kind of Coxeter type uh, flavor to, to the presentation. So it'll be diagrams, you know, like thinking diagrams. We call this double Coxeter diagrams. And the, the diagrams, you know, their entire theory of Coxeter groups and so on, they're crystallographic Coxeter groups, which, uh, you know, there are the groups that uh, keep stable some lattice in the, in the reflection representation and so on. So, and there is a classification of such things. Of, of crystallographic Coxeter groups uh, and diagrams. So these diagrams are you know, crystallographic Coxeter diagrams. I think if you, if you want to know precisely with some condition, they cannot be more than four laces. And if you, if you have cycles in your diagram, you start counting how many double laces you have and should be an even number in the cycle. 
you start looking in uh, uh, in a cycle, how many uh, triple edges you have, and again, it should be an even number. So that's a good condition. Okay, so our graphs will be connected graphs, you know, for you know, kind of ir irreducibility, uh, and we'll have at most four edges, and we, we will mark some nodes. You know, the, the nodes are the marking is not important for the diagram. The marking is important for the object that you associate with that. So at some point we will will distinguish this this generators of your object attached to such nodes, uh, and the mark one we'll call them affine. In the unmarked nodes, we'll call them uh, finite nodes. Very good. So he, here is what we will have this this dot in the middle. You know, so uh, usual dot will not have this, this black black core, and we will. Sometimes have some shorthand. You see, uh, it, take this double node, which is kind of two black, black dots in a circle. That's shorthand for this, for this, um, <clears throat> for this diagram right here. Right. So there are two two FI nodes connected by four edges. Yeah, this kind of uh, saves you some trouble of drawing all these four edges everywhere. And you might have three, three FI nodes, which are all connected with each other by <clears throat> four edges. And then this is our, our, our shorthand for that. Very good. Now, uh, this shorthand will appear in the diagrams. Yeah, so for example, if you have something like this, you have some finite nodes, and then you have this double node, maybe at some point connected. What it means is, so this double node is replaced with something like this, and then the connectivity with the rest of the diagram, it's inherited by each, by each of a kind of a black dots inside there. Yeah, this is just short, shorthand. And I think I put one for the triple node. You see, if you have a triple node here instead of double node, right, you expand this up to this, thing, you know, we look with a magnifying glass in there and you realize these are not just three dots, there are three dots connecting, connected. So, so these are like quarks really, you know, it's, it's just, you, you look, you look at the three quarks and they're connected by a strong force, you know, <laughs> so it's a very strong bond between them. And, uh, Right, and this is connected to the rest of the diagram by one edge. So the connection is inherited by each. Okay, so that's for, for us to understand a little bit the diagrams that we're going to write. So these are the diagrams that we consider and some classification. So there are some diagrams which have three dots and some diagrams which have two dots. And if you look at them, these are just, if you kind of, kind of ignore this special, special dots here, you know, we've, where you have a circle with a three black dots, it's just the, the kind of affine thinking diagrams. Yeah, it's, it's exactly the same thing. So all, all the types, and then um, you have these things with two dots. And this would correspond, so if you make this the regular circle, uh, it will correspond to some, uh, let's say, A2N2 in the, in the table of uh, affine thinking diagrams. And I kind of took a grandstand here, put the A1 into the C series. I think I think we know uh, enough about the representation here of SL2 to, to put it in the C series. I mean, it's, 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 I think this is where it naturally belongs, not in the A series. Okay, and then we have uh, another set of this will uh, of diagrams, which, which do not have 
a double dot, but kind of two affine, two, two separate dots. You see, they're not connected by four edges. They're just connected by uh, two or three edges. So kind of, we don't have a strong bond, but kind of, uh, kind of a weaker bond. And you, you just have this two. And this will correspond to the, well, as in how kind of uh, in, in, the, in the list of uh, affine linking diagrams, the kind of, uh, if you don't know where you put the affine node, it's kind of a set set, it's the same set of diagrams, right? There's some intersection in the diagrams. Because Think about it this way, the coxeter, the, the, the wild groups are repeat, right? In the twisted and untwisted. But um, if, if, if this, if you kind of, if you're more nuanced about uh, how you add the affine nodes, this will correspond to the twisted. Very good. So these are the, the graphs that appear. And now I'm gonna attach some, some algebras to these graphs. Uh, some some groups rather. First, okay. So when I write BD, it means the, the Coxeter break group. So you know you put add, have generators as many as nodes, and um, you impose relations, which are just braid relations according to how many laces between the, the nodes that you select. Uh, and if you also impose this square of a generator is equals one, you, you, you get the coxeter. So up to this point, there is no, you see, there's no difference between affine node, fine and node, same thing. Uh, so the, the object, which is uh, interesting for us is this, some quotient of this braid group which is denoted in the same way, but with a kind of this bold B. Yeah, so some, so, so some, some notations so that we can write down the relation. So um, I have finite nodes, I'm labeling them somehow from one to N and uh, generators you, for the generator you just use this T. Now, of course, you have a right the Coxter group, it's a quotient of the braid group. Uh, but once you fix generators, you have some sort of a canonical section, which is just a set theoretic section. Right? You, you take, take some element of the Coxter group, you write it in terms of a generator, right? In, in, reduced, in reduced form, and then replace, write the same, same thing in the braid group. Same generators in the same order. It doesn't depend on the reduced expression, but uh, it's not a group morphism either. <laughs> so very good. Now, whenever you have an affine node, you can get an element of so, okay, maybe some, some distinction. I'm not sure if you observe it. So my, di my double Coxeter diagrams have dots, you know, they're decorated. There is letters decorated like A, N, triple dot or something like that, right? So when, when I write something which is not decorated, it means throw away all the affine nodes, look just at the finite Coxeter diagram. So what, what I've written here, in, you know, these three lines are just about the finite, the finite nodes, the finite part of the diagram. And I'm gonna start discussing a little bit the, the affine nodes. And whenever you have an affine node, right, ignore, maybe there are several affine nodes, but ignore the other, just fo focus on just one affine node. Uh, you know, it's attached to the finite diagram. So it looks like an affine Coxeter diagram. And this determines an element of a braid group of a, of a finite diagram. Uh, how uh, you see, I think if you, if you look at, 
let's suggest that the level of coxeter groups, this affine element gives you this affine reflection, let's call it S0 as it's usually denoted. And this S0, you can let it act in its reflection representation. And only on the span of the roots associated to the finite nodes, it will act, you know, it will, you'll have to take a quotient, but it, it will act as a reflection coming from the, from, from the finite coxeter group. And that's a reflection with respect to some kind of the highest, highest root or something like that depending on how you attach it, highest root, highest short root. Uh, but you, you, you get this reflection. So now to that reflection in the Coxeter group, you attach, you, you can attach this, this element in the, in the braid group. Yeah, so to, to each affine node, because it's connected in some way to the finite diagram, it, 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 it produces this reflection. <laughs> Yeah, is this, is this, um, pl please interrupt me if it's, uh, you know. So the translation part you don't take. Hmm? Yes, if you take S naught, the translation part also will be there. Uh, if you take S naught, uh, right, the, the, the affine, well, let me put it this way, the S naught, it's a reflect, it's an affine reflection with respect to an affine root. Right, which is like delta minus a finite root. Yeah, mm -hmm. it means to, to to this to this S not you associate S theta, you know, which which this theta being this this finite root. So go, like a quotient map, you are going, you are seeing. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't need to talk about. You see. Um, I mean, we, we can talk about affine, uh, affine, affine coxeter groups, and affine he algebras. It's fine. You don't. It, it's more basic than that. Uh, I think that's what we're trying to to explain. But we are allowed to talk, of course, about affine root systems. So if you take um, kind of the root, the simple root associated with this affine node, let's call it alpha zero, is typically of a form delta minus theta. And this theta, it's a root, it's a highest root, let's say, in the finite root system. So the element that I'm associated is reflection with respect to this theta. Okay, okay, thanks. Right? And I, 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 I'm taking the, the, the braid root element corresponding to that reflection. So it's a product of these t's in exactly the same order as they would appear if I try to express this reflection in terms of simple reflection. So that's what I'm doing. Okay, so just as notation, so sometimes you have three affine nodes, but they're all connected in the same way to the finite diagram, right? And this associated element of a finite break group, I, I call it theta. You know, theta is from the theta of the highest root. That's kind of suggestive of that. And sometimes you have two, two affine nodes you give them names somehow, it doesn't matter. Theta zero and phi zero. So you get two elements of this. Yeah, two, 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 two such elements in the finite braid group. Like a braid group associated with a finite diagram. So not finite groups by any mean. Okay. And sometimes, you know, you have, especially when you have these triple nodes, uh, you see they are connected, they're connected with a finite diagram, you know. And the finite the node they're connected to, I'm gonna call it T subscript I theta. So it's just one particular, one of these finite nodes is distinguished because it's connected to the affine nodes. Very good. And uh, L0 is kind of a number of uh, strings of laces between this finite node and the alpha. Very good. And this is kind of an extra complication. You get these elements. Uh, you remember this capital phi, capital theta. 
So this is another reflection, right? It's, it corresponds to another reflection. You conjugate one, one reflection by the other one. And then you take the braid group elements corresponding to that. So there's this uh, theta field, uh, tilde, and tilde and uh, phi tilde. And um, you also take this uh, products. I know this is very, it starts looking very uh, messy, but these elements have remarkable properties and in, inside the braid group. And um, they play kind of a, a key role in understanding this kind of uh, the Daha attached to this, this twisted cake, uh, cases. So, so for example, they, they, they satisfy exactly the braid relations in this, uh, for, for, for this diagram. To, to give you one example of uh, how, how crucial they are in the structure. Yeah, but these are far from being just single generators or just kind of complicated generators, uh, products of generators. Okay. But once you realize that uh, you should look at them, then the, the, you'll have to play a role. So, as I said, you take this, this, this Coxter diagrams, you take the Coxter break groups. That's not quite what we look at. We look at the quotient. And I'm going to tell you these relations, right? So for the, for the triple dot diagrams, you, you just, just one set of relations. You take the product of the generators attached to the F I nose times this theta, you know, this special theta. And the relations is that this element commutes with everything else. It's like a, this element C, it's central. Sometimes, you know, when you have this double lace, this appears only in the diagram, which is labeled CN triple dot. You have to impose some, there is an extra relation. You know, we'll call it elliptic. This is the only thing that doesn't look like a kind of a braid relation. It, it's, it's mixing the, it's mixing the affine generators two by two, you see. So the affine generators and um, the finite node connected to them. So if you look at just this, you see two affine nodes connected by four laces and each connected with a finite node by two laces. You get, you get this kind of relation, but it's just for one diagram. Now for this um, umlaut diagrams. So these are two affine nodes, which are not connected by four edges, by maybe by two or three, you get this, this more longish product, which is uh, forced to commute with everything else. So you see here, you get the affine generators appear kind of twice and you get this theta, phi and the C. And for the double dot diagrams, you get this. The square is central. They're, yeah, these, these are relatives somehow. And again, if, if there are two laces, this is extra relation. So, um, so this present, this object still has uh, ha has a lot of symmetry. So, yeah, I mean. It's it's fairly it's it's a fairly minimal presentation of of a daha. I'll, I'll explain that this. So uh, what you're getting in this fashion is not the Hecke algebra. You're getting the kind of the braid group underlying the Hecke algebra. To get the Hecke algebra, you just have to put in some quadratic relations for the generators. But that, that's kind of a, the heart of the structure is this one. I presume it's a fundamental group after you take the quotient, but is it a fundamental group before you take the quotient? Um, frankly, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So okay. usually when you wait, when you look at this Coxeter, you take, you take some Coxeter diagram, you look at the reflection representation, uh, 
and uh, you, you look at the space of regular points in the reflection representation. You can, can you have to complex reflection representation. It's a real representation, but you look at the complexified, the complex reflection representation. And in, in there, you so kind of um, typically uh, what happens is the, the singular points sit on these hyperplanes, which correspond to the reflection in your Coxeter group. So you get some 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 complex space model or some hyper uh, without some hyperplanes and then you can look at the fundamental group of that and this is usually the braid group um, and right now i know that what i said is true for finite and affine <laughs> affine coxeter groups and I don't know whether it's true uh, a little bit more generally, but that would be kind of a... Okay, very good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And after you take the quotient, um, it is still a Cox, it's, it's still a fundamental group. It's still a fundamental group. Uh, yeah, let me leave it. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a similar space. I mean, it's nothing, uh, not, nothing too crazy, but yeah, it requires uh, uh, me to say something to describe it. Okay, very good. So, <clears throat> right. So. Uh, this this structure will have some automorphisms, and all the automorphisms. So it's you know you have these generators, affine generators, finite generators, and all the automorphism will fix all the generators attached to the finite node. So the only action that you get it's on the affine nodes. Yeah, this is what I'm going to tell you about. But uh, there are also automorphisms which mix finite and affine nodes and so on. So basically you look at one of this, these diagrams, like let's take an interesting one, uh, let's say this one's right here, uh, these four. You see the diagrams themselves will have symmetries which mix, mix finite and affine nodes. And all this will give you automorphisms of the corresponding groups that mix finite and so yeah, like this one has a lot, you know, kind of a dihedral group. Of, uh, so these were not known, but you know, from this description, you can kind of they stare you in the face, you know. Okay, very good. So right, so when I when I this notation is just to tell you that there are automorphisms of the structures, whatever diagram you look at. And they fix the finite part. Yeah, all, all the nodes are all, all the kind of finite braid group inside there. It's fixed pointwise. So for the triple node diagrams, you, you, you just have to define two, right? This this, <clears throat> this gamma tildes that I told you about always had two, two generators. So I'm defining two automorphism and taking the group generated by that and studying it. And uh, you see what they do. Uh, right, so the only thing you have to worry about, I mean, one thing that you have to worry about is that you see in the presentation, let's see. You have theta one, theta two, theta three times theta, which is central. So these things you see preserve the product. If you take theta one, a apply to theta one, theta two, theta three. So I take the product of all these things. Theta zero, two multiply with this, this cancels out. And then the theta one, theta two, theta three, the product is preserved. This is, so this is a familiar action actually. It's a, uh, what is it? It's a, uh, the braid group on three strands acting on um, the free group on three letters. 
right, fundamental group of let's say sphere minus three points uh it's, it's a, fr a free group on two letters when you have this braid group acting uh what's the uh, let me put it another way it's uh it's the action of a mapping class group on the fundamental group of a surface, right? Take a surface as a fundamental group and it's mapping class group. And it's always the mapping class group acts on the fundamental group. So this is what you see. Very good. And you check, you have to check, you know, that this, you know, how, how, how do these automorphisms, first of all, their automorphism, how they compose with each other and so on. This this uh, <clears throat> generators of a fiber of a projection from the gamma tilde to gamma, so you know the cover acts by some inner automorphism, but ultimately this is kind of a theorem. So whatever they generate, you get this this this, this cover of gamma one one, which in this case is just SL two Z acting at automorphism, and then you have some inner automorphisms, and they it's a faithful action when you descend to here uh, you know like minus identity might act with an inner automorphism or something but we, we know exactly when that happens so this is the triple diagrams and now the double diagram so uh, for this is kind of a Two dot diagram. You get this um, gamma one two prime in this fashion. So you see, if you remember, the generators were kind of with generators A and B conjugated by B or something. I think the second one was squared. So you just check that this happens in this case. Uh, and for this umlaut diagrams, which can two affine nodes, but not strongly connected. Again, it's some, you see all these this automorphism, they fix a generator and they conjugate the other. Like B fixes theta zero and conjugates phi zero in some fashion. And again, you check that certain expression act by inner conjugations and you prove this theorem you say you take uh, r equals two if the diagram has the affine nodes are connected by two laces and r equals three if it's connected by three laces and you get this gamma one r groups acting as outer automorphism so this, this can be seen from the, this presentation now very good so far, I got this just only the secondary congruent subgroups appearing. But let me tell you how mo mo more groups appear. Uh, so the, the, this, the structures that we constructed from these diagrams are kind of the smallest possible in this kind of a zoo of dahas these are the smallest ones that appear the kind of a, the kind of the kind of lattices are as small as possible right you don't have lattices indexed by weights you have lattices in uh, indexed by the root lattice uh, and you can extend a little bit of the lattices so uh, and Typically what's happening, I, I think you can do it without talking about lattices or anything like that. You just fix an affine node and you look at the affine diagram and it has some, <clears throat> the diagram has automorphisms, right? So some, some outer automorphisms and that group, it's a small group of outer, outer automorphisms. You can make that small group of outer automorphism act on your structures. So you can pick two, you can pick two of the affine nodes you know, sometimes there are just two, you have nothing to do. Sometimes there are three and you, <laughs> you, you pick two, two of them. But you, you, you know, especially the, the, the two affine nodes are attached differently, you get two, 
two groups, two small groups of outer automorphs. They're always, as abstract groups, are always isomorphic for some reason. Uh, but you can, you can throw in this outer automorphism, you know, you, you can study them and they act on your structures and you can take this kind of iterated semi-direct products. Uh, now, it seems that you have broken some symmetry here, you know, you have specified some order in which to take the products. Uh, it's a theorem that it doesn't matter. You, it's kind of a separate <clears throat> thing, but yeah. So these are kind of fully extended. So this is where the lattices are, lattices of weights, co-weights, whatever you prefer, uh, as opposed to root lattice and so on. You know, the kind of X, X operators, Y operators are indexed by weights. And before we're just indexed by roots. Uh, elements in the root lattice. And then you check that these outer automorphisms are compatible with this previous automorphisms that you constructed and you, you get this extension. So again, so far you have managed to look at bigger objects, but kind of group of automorphism is the same. So this is where Chirignic theorems would, would fit. It would be like R equals one, and will be this extended guys, triple dot extended. So just the R equals one part of the sphere and is due to Cheradnik. This is his only original contribution. This is a very important insight. I mean, this is, this is a really fundamental part of the structure. Uh, very good. But now you can look at kind of intermediate extensions, right? You, Kind of intermediate intermediate subgroups between the kind of a joint one and the extended one. Uh, we call this a joint and simply connected by analogy with what's happening in a kind of classification of compact groups. But um, right, so you should think of them as uh, some sort of uh, break groups, whatever, where you you have lattices, but you know, of X operators, Y operators, but by index by something in between the root lattice and the weight lattice. So there is not a lot, but there is some, depending on the particular situation. And uh, in this case, this gamma one tilde R action might not keep this stable. And we did study uh, if there is something that's keeping it stable and you, you get a subgroup, you only get a subgroup and it's a um, kind of fairly big uh, subgroup kind of, uh, it's a finite index subgroup in, in, in here. And it descends to, uh, again, like an, to an outer action of a congruence group. And the level, it's at most the size of this uh, group of outer automorphisms. So again, it's like something two or the two or the three, but in type A, you get something maybe of order N. Uh, and um, this group that we, so that we found uh, makes everything stay, whatever extension, intermediate subgroup here you pick, it, it keeps it stable. There is no, uh, it doesn't discriminate between them. But now if you go and pick particular extensions, you might have, might, might find a slightly bigger subgroup. And uh, well, that's some work, you know, I haven't done it. This requires somebody to, tabulate all the possible sub extensions and to, to investigate whether this can be extended. So a kind of a, a very precise list of what, it should be a finite list of congruence with groups that appear, uh, which, which is uh, totally doable, but I, I don't have it at this point. But they're all between this gamma tilde and you know gamma one R. So it will be probably some what one might find some surprises there, but very good. So this is the theorem. And now if you want to go to the Heck algebras, as I said, 
this is a kind of a underlying structure to go to the heck algebra and just act quadratic quadratic relations like this so pick all the generators finite affine whatever you want and put quadratic relations like this and usually um hmm. i think this is maybe i should cross this out i don't know how to even carefully check uh, so this this c this element c that kind of the, the relations so how are the relations you see usually the relations like this like this element c is central these are the quotients and that's usually uh people denote that by uh q and make it a parameter in the field but other than that and if you do this you get you get the corresponding hacky algebras now you should ask well how many generators do i have to uh, how, how, how many parameters t do i have to put in and so on and it's very nice to you know one little perk of this double coxeter diagrams is that you can read it from the diagram uh, what what you do is the following you you look at the diagram and you erase all non-simple edges, double edges, triple edges, with four, four, four laces, you erase everything and you get a disconnected, possibly disconnected graph. You just count the number of uh, connected components. So, so if you do this for F triple dot, right? So if you remember, in this gap here, you had a double edge, you know, that's a diagram of F4, and this these three affine nodes were connected by four edges. So you raise all that, you get um, you know, a graph with two components. So you'll have two two parameters. So kind of these T's associated to nodes in one connected components will have to be the same. If you do this for this umlaut diagram. Of type B two or C two, um, right? They're all in the diagram. You had double edges everywhere, and now you get these four, four dots. So you have four parameters. So there are things which are not quite, especially in this kind of more exotic diagrams, were not quite uh, kind of escaped a little bit. Sometimes the classification and so on. People have tried to write carefully. Including McDonald himself, uh, you know all the situations and so on. But I, I think this particular one maybe escaped. There are some cases where you have, uh, yeah, a little bit more exotic structure. Okay, uh, so maybe I should stop. I I I, I don't know. Yeah, so I, I prepared just just in case people are interested. Uh, I, I prepared some um, so, some explanation of how this connects with uh, kind of more um, uh, you know many people like this uh, uh, description of uh, affine Hecke algebras in terms of this kind of. Uh, reductive group data, you know, they have some root system, some lattices and so on. So that's kind of the most general construction. I'm not sure. Uh, I know for sure Mark Heyman wrote it in that half fashion. Maybe, maybe Arun, you too, I, I don't remember. But uh, so, so, so this is something that people like to do. And uh, uh, kind of what I want to say is that if you investigate very good, very carefully, the, oh, let, let me just keep over this. I, I don't want, it's just, uh, I think, too heavy at this point. But um, what I kind of at the, at the end of the day, you associate with braid groups, of course, and Hecke algebras and so on. And what's happening with your, so, so you have two. You have a pair of reductive group data, you know, so you have um, 
you you kind of have a, a root system and two lattices in, in duality, right? So you have two a pair of such things and to to, to, to this structure you associate with Hecke algebras. And you, you look at these pairs and so on, and it's possible to separate kind of a semi-simple part and the central part, pretty much like separate kind of a torus in a reductive group into a semi-simple torus and some, some other center. And uh, you look at the structure and kind of arting groups break up like this. All right, so you have some 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 center central part of your arting group and something attached to some kind of semi-simple data and this is kind of almost semi-direct product you might have some you know some element here which is in the center and it's some power of it it's in the center here but um, you know some small intersection some and kind of a um, of the automorphisms that you can you construct, actually they don't act on the central part at all. They're just automorphisms of this semi-simple part. And, uh, right, so that's what I wrote. The structure is, is, is captured by this semi-simple part, which is kind of an interesting part of a data. And, uh, as you look at the semi-simple part, you, you, you see that whatever you construct, it's some intermediate group between the case where the data, it's a kind of a joint data. The lattices are root lattices, core root lattices like that. And you kind of simply connected data, which is where the lattices are full, full weight lattices, something like this. So this is what you construct. So, uh, Ultimately, what you construct, it's in the intermediate subgroup between the, what we call this. So this will be the group con uh, constructed from the diagram, and this will be the extended, extended break groups in the previous, in the previous uh, construction, realization, how, how you want to call it. Okay, and um, yeah, that's what I explained. And uh, this, in this lattice, so again, I kind of this compacted the notation a little bit. This should be two pairs of, you know, you know a pair of reductive group dat data, but this, this root lattices could be the root lattice of the same root system or of dual root systems. And this correspond to this untwist, untwisted or twisted diagram so in our in our presentation is triple dot or double dot diagrams and i think there is an m which is in the construction you know that i skipped which i explained we you can always choose it to be one okay so i i, I think that's that's enough okay thank you very much uh so uh, I have a question. This uh, double uh, double of an arting group. Uh, so that one doesn't uh, does it have Coxter type generators? Because the way you constructed from that bold B of X and it's close. It's, it's close to it uses something very similar to again the automorphism. Yeah, that. So uh, again. Um... Right, depends what you call the double affine <laughs> arting group, right? This is something which is, as Arun pointed out, is something which is close to being a fundamental group, right? I mean, whatever Cherenik works with mainly, and people like to work with, is this fully extended Heike algebras, fully extending arting groups. You know, because they have all the structure there, kind of full structure. Mm -hmm. But the underlying group there, the underlying braid group there, it's not really a braid group. It's uh, 
it's quite the opposite kind of a smaller structure that you can construct. You have your lattices be as small as possible. That thing, it's a braid group of something. And this is what comes up from these diagrams. It's close to being kind of a coxeter braid group. It's not quite a coxeter braid group, but mm. it's a quotient, some, some sort of a, I don't want to say small quotient, but it's some you know, fairly simple to describe quotient. Of a Cox debris. So it's a braid group of some topological space. It's a, it's, a, it's a fundamental group of some topological space. So it looks like something that looks like a braid group on the line that I described. Braid, a uh, uh, fundamental group of some complement space of space without certain hyperplanes. So it's a fundamental group, but also very close to being a Coxeter break, which is something abstract constructed just from the diagram. You know, you have to look at the diagram and put some some kind of braid relations according to number of uh, edges between nodes. Uh, it's not quite that. It's just a, it's, it's a quotient of a Coxeter break. And uh, actually, that was a right. It was a kind of a some understanding that people had, the expert had that this cannot be, you know, it cannot be a, co a co cost coxter break group. And I, I looked at that, and I actually gave a proof. It's in the I put it as an appendix in in this in this paper, but. Yeah, it's kind of something which is of independent interest, and I I, I prove that it cannot be a, a, cannot come from a coxeter break itself. So this kind of this quotient is the best you can do. Mm -hmm. So using this realization of Daha like as a quotient, like do we get any new uh, type of presentation or? Uh, a new uh, presentation or representation? Uh, presentation, like presentation. So this is a new present. Yeah, this is kind of a this is a new presentation. It, it's it's. I mean, for me, it was. Uh, you know, I, I I can tell you kind of a little bit of a, uh, the story how this emerged. Um, I, I couldn't understand Cherenik's proofs for the kind of, a, the kind of what he calls the duality involution. Um, he was going through like three papers, which were like a, like a circular reference, where you know each was quoting the other, but proof was missing. And um, kind of as you as you write down the structure, it looks that there is. It's not symmetric in, let's say, X and Y, but there is some, some symmetry there and it's complicated to explain. And uh, uh, Wright is kind of is asking for some more symmetric presentation. And uh, it's, it's, Sid Hart has, has done his, his work on uh, Kornwinder polynomials. In fact, he, he wrote down the um, Heck algebras. Uh, attached to that case. And in, in there, there are three generators, you know, there are these three affine generators. <laughs> it comes with three affine generators. So it, 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 it's, it's all a bit counterintuitive. You shouldn't look like you have two lattices, like an X lattice and the Y lattice. It looks like it should be two, just two affine generators. But in his case, he had three. And uh, uh, he, he, he suggested that, you know, it might be possible, it might be not necessary to have three generators, but it, it might be helpful to, to kind of formally acknowledge the existence of this third generator. <laughs> and that's how, um, and it's, it's tied up like uh, with, you know, kind of technical issues on construction of intertwiners and so on. So it's kind of affine intertwiners that are useful for uh, in the theory of McDonald polynomials, they kind of are really attached to this middle generator. So, so you know, some, so some things were kind of asking for this third generator and that's how, that's how we kind of um, guessed that 
uh, it might have a, a kind of a reasonable simple presentation using three affine genera. No, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Stop the recording. All right, thank you.